there's two blockchains, arguably more, but let's say two blockchains that have fully implemented sharding, which in my view proves that we can do L1 scaling. And if we can do L1 scaling, why, why, for God's sakes, why would we accept all this centralization? For God's sakes, why would we accept all this fragmentation? Why would we accept all of those fees? Hi, everyone. Welcome to Unchained, your no-hype resource for all things crypto. I'm your host, Laura Shin, author of The Cryptopians. I started covering crypto nine years ago, and as a senior editor at Forbes, was the first mainstream media reporter to cover cryptocurrency full-time. This is the September 10th, 2024 episode of Unchained. If you're envisioning ways to make an impact on transforming global systems through blockchain, the Stellar Meridian 2024 conference is for you. Get $50 off your ticket now at meridian.stellar.org by using the code UNCHAINEDPOD. Are you looking to level up your crypto? With zero trading fees, boosted rewards, and priority support, Coinbase One is your answer. Learn more and get a free month with promo code UNCHAINED at coinbase.com slash one. Mantle's Emeth is now the fourth largest LST with $1.3 billion in TVL. Emeth offers holders cumulative incentives and airdrops, in addition to native ETH POS yields. This includes exclusive rewards like Eigen and Cook. Check it out at emeth.mantle.xyz slash campaigns. Polkadot is the original and leading layer zero blockchain with over 2000 plus developers. And the Polkadot 2.0 upgrade will be a massive accelerator for the ecosystem, making it faster, more secure and adaptable. Perfect for GameFi and DeFi to build, grow and scale. Join the community at polkadot.network slash ecosystem slash community. Today's topic is Ethereum's roadmap and the role of layer twos in the ecosystem. Here to discuss are Justin Bonds, founder and CIO of Cyber Capital, and Ryan Berkman's Ethereum community member and investor. Welcome, Justin and Ryan. Thanks, Laura. Great to be here. There's been a lot of consternation this whole year about the price of Ether and how it's vastly underperforming both Bitcoin and Solana. The ETH to BTC ratio has dropped by about a third over the last year, while the Sol to ETH ratio has quintupled. And recently, there's been a lot of questioning about whether layer twos are parasitic to Ethereum layer one. So all of this has raised questions about whether Ethereum is following the right roadmap, and I believe the two of you have different positions on this. But before we dive into all the details, why don't we just make sure everybody kind of understands the architecture of Ethereum so you know they can kind of follow the slightly technical discussion. Um, Ryan, why don't we start with you? Um, Ethereum's now following what's known as a roll-up centric roadmap. Can you explain what this means and where Ethereum is in terms of that roadmap? That's right, Laura. About four years ago, Ethereum made the decision to pursue uh, what we at the time called the roll-up centric roadmap uh, and, and still call it today. It's also called increasingly the L2 centric roadmap. And that idea is that the Ethereum layer one specializes as a maximally decentralized and incredibly neutral base layer. And instead of serving uh, mass market users directly, the primary customers of the L1 become uh, whales, corporation, governments, and L2s. And then uh, the world comes on chain on Ethereum through the layer two, you know, the marketplace of layer twos, uh, which uh, instead of being a centrally planned scaling roadmap where L1 developers or, or, or any, any given person or authority dictates uh, who can offer a layer two, instead, anybody around the world can step up and say, I think I'd like to make a layer two for this purpose, for my, my country, my city, my domain of specialty, my existing customer base. And then they can pick and choose from uh, a toolkit of emerging tech stacks and middleware to really design the custom solution that works best for them. And so uh, it's, it's this power of the L2 marketplace combined with the maximum decentralization and credible neutrality of the L1 that really forms the basis of Ethereum's scaling strategy moving forward. And so, Justin, we're now in this current state where um, this kind of divide that Ryan has described does exist, um, and that not only percolates out to kind of how the users are sort of separated, but also how some duties and revenue are divided between the layer twos and Ethereum layer one. Um, can you describe how that works and also the role of the Dencoon upgrade in that setup? 
Um, sure, but I'm, I'll move a bit more uh, away from descriptive and, and start talking about some of my criticisms of this because, um, um, no, I, I do think that this is just a, a travesty, really. I mean, I just, I just want to point out that all these layer twos that Ryan is referring to, like if we just look at the top 15 alone, they're all centralized, right? So like what is a layer two scaling roadmap? I think it's just not scaling the layer one. And, and I have a real problem with just not scaling the layer one at all and allowing these kind of private for, you know, for profit, you know, rent seeking L2s to basically, you know, take all of the Ethereum users away. I think, I think that is really disgusting. And I think that's really a betrayal of the cypherpunk dream. I mean, that's, that's where we are today. Yeah. But just from like a, a technical perspective, like what activity is happening on the layer twos and what activity is happening on the layer one? Right. Right. So the layer one, um, capacity is obviously very low. So the idea behind Ethereum's, uh, layer two roadmap to now steel man, the argument is that, uh, basically almost all of the usage is going to move to layer twos. That's the idea. If you do ex execution is moving to layer twos, that means smart contracts, that means apps, that means value transfer. That means basically everything is, is basically being pushed to layer twos by the economics of the layer one, basically becoming unusable and, and too expensive. And, uh, basically it passed part of the Ding Kuhn upgrade. And this was uh, known as data, sh also known as data sharding. This is where L2s are able to post um, uh, data on the uh, layer one and uh, they pay a small fee to the layer one for that. And that fee only represents a tiny fraction of the total fees these layer twos are collecting that are just going directly into their wallets. And in this sense, I actually think that, you know, this configuration is highly extractive and, you know, as you said, parasitical. Yeah, and, and what they're obtaining for that fee is security. Um, and as far as I understand, I think also data availability is happening on layer one as well. That's yeah. right. Okay. Yeah. All right. So we did already start to move into your criticism. Um, but you know, you you had a tweet thread that began, Ethereum is dying while L2s dance on its grave. So can you yeah, lay out <laughs> Yeah, you have the most descriptive language, Justin. I've always liked that about you. <laughs> and I, yeah, I've been a fan for years, you know, uh, you wrote, you're a lot of, a lot of great threads and I'm not sure we've ever disagreed before this issue. Okay. Materially. Yeah. But so Justin, why don't you kind of lay out, um, your, your argument a little bit more piece sure. by piece. No, that, that makes sense. And, and just, just for a bit of history. And I think, I think me and Ryan have probably agreed for, for most of our history. That's because I was a huge Ethereum supporter, uh, about two years ago, you could say, is when I was still gun ho and going hard for Ethereum because I believed it still would scale. And my, my, my position basically flipped when I realized that it, it did this pivot towards layer one scaling. And to me, that, that very much echoes the, um, you know, what happened to BTC as well. And I also don't agree with what happened to BTC. You meant layer two scaling. Yes, yes. Yeah, well, basically two, right. the, uh, the sacrifice of layer one scaling for the sake of uh, layer two scaling. That's the part I have a disagreement with. The thing is, I'm not against layer twos per se by themselves. I'm, I'm what I'm really against is, is arbitrarily limiting layer one scalability. That's, that's really what I have a problem with. And I think that is the part that, that is highly problematic. I would say if we look at one-to-one -one basic value transfers, Ethereum can do maybe a hundred TPS, right? Or 120, depending on how we cal calculate this. Now, I think this is way too low compared to the new technologies that are coming down the pipeline. And I think that that makes Ethereum extremely uncompetitive. And okay, the, the layer two critique is very extensive. I'll, I'll maybe just give you some bullet points and you can attack which one you best see fit. Uh, so one, it's economically extractive, right? Because instead of having, say, all of the usage happening on a layer one, right, uh, you're basically outsourcing it to these private enterprises that are able to skim fees off the top, right? VCs, you know, and investors and private companies are literally skimming fees off of these layer twos. That's, that's literally impossible to do on a layer one, right? That's, that's the part where it becomes extractive and, and, and it's not a net good anymore, right? Uh, and at the same point, fragmentation, right, is destroying the UX. Fragmentation is destroying composability, uh, li liquidity, you know, all of these things are just going down a, down a terrible direction. And as I also mentioned before, it's all centralized. And I don't believe it will actually decentralize en masse. We have no good reason to think that. We actually have good reason to think the opposite because of the incentives. 
So for most of these L2s to quote unquote decentralize, they'll have to sacrifice millions of dollars of revenue. I think that's completely unrealistic. Um, I'll let you respond to that because I already gave a lot of different points for you to unpack. Well, wait, but before we do that, just out of curiosity, Justin, because, you know, there was a time in the past when fees on Ethereum shot up as high as about $72. So, you know, that was um, kind of during a bull market phase. But I wondered, like, what to you would be kind of an optimal fee or, you know, at that time when the fees were that high, what did you think would be the best way to scale Ethereum? Um, so I, I think there's many ways to scale. I think it very much depends on how you view the trade-offs. Um, so I, I would say you have DAGs, you have uh, f- different forms of parallelization. So and if you look a, at some- A DAG is something acrylic graph. It, yeah, direct. Uh, it's, it's, I'll just use the acronym, but it, it's, it's a form of scaling technology that, that allows for high parallelization. But it's actually one of my least favorites. Uh, there's also uh, direct forms of parallelization, like you have that, what, like what you see in Solana. I might p- point out the research that Monad is doing very in- is very interesting because Monad is actually doing this in a way where the EVM is still, um, it's still EVM compatible. So Monad is, looks like they could probably do around 10,000 TPS and a lot of paralyzed sy- systems today are sitting around 20 to 40,000 TPS. If you're willing to sacrifice some speed, um, then I think sharding is, is an excellent option. Considering that Ethereum block times right now are 13 seconds and we can build sharded systems with six second block times. And that would give us uh, you know, current TPS exceeding 100,000 with a th- theoretical TPS potentially going above a million. Um, and this is all while keeping node requirements low which is one of the advantage of sharding, which is why Ethereum was pursuing it for all of those years. So I think when Ethereum decided to pivot away from sharding, they said, this is too hard. But in the meantime, competing blockchains have implemented it. And I think, I think that's one of the reasons I'm so gung ho on this as well is like, you, you know, Ethereum stopped scaling too soon. You know, the, the technology that's coming around is, is just so powerful. Okay. And the last question before we go to Ryan for his rejoinder, I, I asked on Twitter if there was a specific number or metric that people would use to determine where, whether an L2 was parasitic. Interestingly, not that many people voted. And then the people that commented could not agree on what that metric might be, if any. Um, but Justin, it sounds like for you, your issue is the fact that Ethereum chose to scale via layer twos at all. And it's not like you think that there's any world in which you could have this plethora of layer twos and have them not be parasitic is that am i understanding that correctly yeah i think the reason why i'm calling it parasitic if i'm being very specific is is we're l2 scaling the narrative and the political lobbying influence the layer one in such a way for it not to scale that's where i think it's parasitic because that's the part where actually ethereum is being held back right like i think I don't have anything against layer twos. If we scale the layer one, if we can get Ethereum up to 10,000 TPS or something, which I think is perfectly reasonable, right? If we were able to do that and we also had layer twos, like that's not parasitic. The, the, the parasitic relationship comes in actually purposefully bottlenecking the layer one for this layer two vision. That's, that's really, I think, where that comes in, if we're being precise with our words. Otherwise, it's just extractive. It's not parasitic, right? Okay. And last thing I will say before we turn to Ryan is that at Unchained, we did do an analysis about at least fees in particular, because that was, uh, you know, one of the metrics that might be possible to look at as a way of judging whether an L2 is parasitic. And um, so, you know, the, obviously the, it's like since then Kuhn and every month is different, but just as an example, in August, OP Mainnet retained $321 for every $1 uh, that they paid to Ethereum L1 for security. Uh, Base came in second place at two hundred twenty-six dollars. So um, obviously, th- those are those are that's a really high ratio. Um, I think for Arbitrum, it was uh, more in the twenty twenty-ish dollar range. Um, but anyway, okay. So Ryan, now there's plenty of points that. Oh, just in- may just and my basic argument around the economics is that free twenty dollars that you mentioned in the scenario of layer one scaling all of the money would just be in the layer one. And that to me is clearly superior. Right. But as we mentioned earlier, if it, the fees get too high, then it suppresses activity. So, okay, Ryan, no, um, go ahead. No, a, a scalable system would be a large number of uh, transactions, each paying a small fee. I, I, oh, don't, I, see. I don't believe in high fees at all. I think that's a bad idea. Okay, got it. 
Okay, now Ryan, please go ahead with your. You you don't view it uh, view them as parasitic, so go ahead. What's your argument? No, Laura, certainly not parasitic. I mean, the, 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 even the word parasitic was chosen by Ethereum proponents to emotionally conjugate the L2 roadmap as some kind of L1 rug. Uh, but it's just not the case. You know, you look at a number like $321 retained by OP when they paid a dollar to Ethereum. And some folks look at this and, you know, the, the, the blob data availability uh, system on the Ethereum L1 is about six months old. And so they look at this and they say, hey, this is proof. It's extractive. It's proof the value goes to layer two. It's proof this was a mistake. And yet what I really see is network effects piling on to the Ethereum L1. Like we're not in this for the season. We're in this for the big picture of as the world economy is increasingly on chain and larger and larger entities are trusting more and more important systems and capital flows in the on-chain context, you know, be that tokenization or DeFi or, or, or various other structures, where are they going to go? And Ethereum's view is that having them all on a single settlement layer, where you enjoy this trustless composability network effect that Eigenlayer's three room has written a fantastic article about, we think that's the big prize that we're fighting for. And so this $321 retained by OP, I mean, the, the view of the, L2 uh, model is fantastic. Great. That $321 represents optimism's opportunity that others are seeing, other corporations, other governments, other NGOs. And so uh, that's why we're seeing such fantastic L2 growth, both in terms of net new users, as well as just the number of L2s rising. And so uh, just to respond to some of Justin's points there, we have to trust the research community. Like I, I have a computer science degree, uh, 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 you know, from a pretty good school that Vitalik dropped out of. And one of the main things I learned at school is that it is unbelievable how smart the smartest people are. And Ethereum has wonderfully attracted this rich research community, not just in the EF, but in, in, in many different uh, satellite independent organizations, academic research labs, you know, folks with their own research budget who choose to study Ethereum's, uh, uh, you know, because they can, because there are these PDF protocol specs that drive neutrality. Uh, and so when this research community comes to us and they say, we can choose between maximum decentralization that can form uh, uh, the world settlement layer for all the world to come on chain in the same zone of sovereignty, the same settlement zone to have risk minimized interoperability for this century's global economy. That's what they say. And they say, look, we can have that or we can have high TPS. And they, they, they tell us, and I trust them, that we can't have both. That, that there, there's not, there's, you know, while there is a frontier of technology that can create like a, like a, net, a, net, a net free lunch, that it's strictly better technology that pro provides similar or better decentralization with similar or better TPS. The fact is that the folks who are designing Ethereum have heard of all this stuff and invented much of it. And so they, they haven't stopped scaling the L1. It's simply that by focusing on the L2 roadmap, they've spent time investing in data availability and, and, and in maximizing decentralization with stuff like the merge and the switch to proof of stake, which increases security efficiency, which helps prepare Ethereum to be the foundation of the global economy. And so when we look at this, this L2 transition, it, it, it's not really that the L1 decided to forsake scaling. It's that we believe in maximum decentralization because we think that's where the value is going to accrue in being the global settlement layer. And then now that we've, uh, we think have nailed this overall model, it's time to continue improving it with technologies like the upcoming peer-to-peer -peer data availability sampling that for the first time will allow an Ethereum home staker to not have to download 100% of the data blobs that layer twos are settling on Ethereum. So it's going to be technologies like that, along with applying zero knowledge technology directly to the L1 in the coming years. It will allow for L1 scaling, but without loss of the decentralization and credible neutrality that comes from simply cranking up the gas limit, you know, as, as for example, Binance Smart Chain did with their EVM, uh, or as we're seeing being done now by the base layer two run by Coinbase, you know, they're specifically able to ramp up their scalability because they've offloaded the settlement to Ethereum. And they've, they've written about this division of labor between the L1 and base extensively. So I, I think, you know, 
there's a couple things going on here as it relates to was this a good decision for Ethereum and Ether the asset? And uh, I think there's two primary things. One, ETH is money. The, the, the value of Ether is related to confidence in Ether, just as it is with Bitcoin. Bitcoin's confidence comes from this 21 million hard cap. It comes from this long-term belief in Bitcoin being uh, hardened and, and not having a lot of change. That drives neutrality. Well, we think Ethereum's confidence is going to come from the Lindy effect of on-chain economy and the sheer amount of on-chain economy on Ethereum. Some of the research work I do is around uh, the total app capital of how much money is just on each chain. Like who is trusting their money on which chain? And today, Ethereum, uh, uh, as of my data snapshot on August 31st, Ethereum had about 13 times more total app capital than Solana, including great diversity of these capital sources in terms of uh, like which tokens, are they all meme coins or, or where are these coming from? Uh, 13 times uh, Solana's. Uh, and, you know, Solana's is about over half meme coins as of this data snapshot. And so people are trusting their money to Ethereum. And we think that as the on-chain economy on Ethereum grows to global ubiquity, you know, because of the investment in maximum decentralization, we're going to see this confidence in Ethereum continue to rise as we just post these fantastic numbers. And that really brings us, you know, Laura and Justin to fees. Nobody can argue that the fee collapse in L1 is spectacular. We're something down like like over ninety nine percent in in you know some days in dollar terms to last bull run, um, about six months before all time highs before fifteen fifty nine kicked in. I think in spring of twenty one, uh, one day the L one posted one hundred and eighteen million in daily fees. Like this is a big staggering number. This came primarily from uh, extractions from leasing coin traders on on their swaps. And so you look at that fee collapse today and you think, oh God, will Ethereum ever get back to having high fees? Well, A, absolutely. I'm 100% in the camp. And e even proponents of the L2 model do not agree on this. You know, uh, But I, I absolutely think that high L1 fees will recover. Uh, and I'm happy to get into that in greater detail. But much more importantly, fees support Ether as money, but don't define it. Ether is money because Ethereum is where the world's next generation economy is going to be. Not, not because of value accrual. Ethereum is not a business. High, high fees don't cause Ether to be valuable. It's Ether being valuable and Ethereum being having a massive on-chain economy that causes fees you know, in the presence of congestion, which you know, today we don't have congestion because Ethereum is successfully scaling. And so I think the TLDR here is that this concept of, of L2s being parasitic directly ignores this evidence that we were trying to move activity to L2s. You have L2 customers like Coinbase explaining that the reason they use L1 is specifically because it's decentralized and they have no plans to spin out into their own chain or you know, run their own consensus. And, and they talk about decentralizing their sequencers. And look, not every L2 is going to be decentralized. The marketplace of L2s means that if an L2 wants to become decentralized, because that's important to their business case, as it is with Coinbase, as it is with Optimism, you know, they, then they will. And, you know, Coinbase is going to be very, very happy to give up their sequencer revenue in exchange for all of the on-chain products they have currently in the pipeline, which, which they've discussed as well. And so really, it, it's not about whether L2s are centralized or decentralized, because the most centralized ones are going to be incredibly fully centralized. The most decentralized ones are going to be almost as decentralized as the L1. It's about having a massive on-chain economy in a single L1 settlement layer that drives confidence and use for Ether as money. And eventually, that confidence and activity will be supported by high L1 fees, both in terms of execution as well as data availability, those, those so-called blob fees that today are like practically zero. And wait, before um, Justin responds, I just wanted to make sure I understood. So you were saying that it doesn't bother you if the L some of the L2s are centralized. You're saying there's going to be a range of them. Some will be extremely centralized and others do. Oh, wow. Interesting. That's right, Laura. We, 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 we predicted the rise of centralized L2s years ago because the incredible thing about the L2 model is it lets you eat your cake and have it too. There was a, a, a boom of private blockchain about five years ago where like every single large org on the planet had like a blockchain division and it was going to change everything. And, uh, and then what they found is that a chain that's on its own is an empty economy and it's just a crappy, you know, or, or a you know, crappy, slightly different database than, you know, your classic MySQL. But the L2 model is going to see a resurgence of uh, private blockchain in the form of L2s that 
get to trustlessly settle on Ethereum while retaining private off-chain data. Data can be private either from keeping it off-chain in a Validium zero-knowledge proof model or uh, by uh, using uh, new ZK, uh, zero-knowledge app layer techniques such as Ernst & Young's uh, Nightfall led by Paul Brody, which is a fantastic state-of-the-art system that, they're, uh, that they've are they been working on for years. And so uh, centralized L2s are part and parcel with the marketplace of L2s in Ethereum scaling strategy. It's not all about decentralization. They are yin and yang. Decentralization is not the future version of centralization. They're, t- they're just tools in the economic toolbox, and it's going to be the you know, the, the, the right, the right fit for the right situation moving forward. Huh. Justin. Okay. Oh, wow. Yes. I've got so much to go on here. I've got a <laughs> big page of notes. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to think I'll do this in order in, in the way that, that you brought up some of these concepts. Um, and I spotted a, the first theme and I was expecting this. Um, it, if, if I were to be blunt, it kind of comes down to you saying, trust me, bro. It's, it's, it's a little bit like, oh, but you have to trust the science. I'm, I'm going to paraphrase you now. You have to trust the science community, right? You have to trust the smartest people because they are right, right? But like, what about the scientists over at Bitcoin? What about the scientists over in Solana? What about the scientists over in Monero? Like, are they wrong? And, and only Ethereum is right? Like, do you see a problem? Don't you see how like biased and like tribalistic it is what you're saying or, or cardano right cardano really prides itself in its scientific attitude and they're like gun ho that ethereum is wrong but the scientist that cardano is right like i mean i mean this argument it's it's really just an argument from authority it's it's an argument from like my tribe is right and your tribe is wrong because we're the best we're we have the most authority we're the smartest i mean Oh, if if you want to have a little back and forth on some of these points, I think that's okay. I think it's more more productive. But I appreciate I'll, that, Justin. So yeah. I'll I'll just I'll, I'll pause you there. Uh, and so, look, none of us are world class blockchain researchers. Not only on this call, but in general, there's always going to be an aspect of trust me, bro. And I think that uh, when it comes to the uh, you know trustworthiness of trust me, bro, we have to look at the track record as well as the supporting evidence from independent entities. So, uh, for example, in Bitcoin, they have Trust Me Bro around the 21 million hard cap. You can find Bitcoin maximalists like uh, like Udi and Eric Wall, who uh, are trying to get OPCAT activated on the Bitcoin L1. And their, their shtick is the 21 million cap is going to be a false promise that gets exceeded unless right. we solve Bitcoin's and, transaction. So and I've been Bitcoin, saying this for years. Bitcoin Trust Me Bro... Right? Right. Yeah, but- we agree on that. And if you look at Solana, they say, trust me, bro, the whole world can come on Solana. Yeah, but, you, just, you know, but, like in, in, in a recent week, Solana kind did of 380 TPS point. and the whole the, the full roll-up ecosystem did 100 TPS. So no, but hold on. full, you, you, full roll-ups are already doing a quarter of Solana's TPS. You're reinforcing my point right now. You realize that, right? You're saying, no, the argument is I trust these guys. These guys are the best. It's really an argument from authority or type of tribalistic argument that right. you make. And, and, and I just so want to my, point that out. My point is that is that while I began with the shared elements of trust me, bro, for Bitcoin and Solana, what what is what is different for Ethereum is when you get very serious actors like Coinbase who yeah. who come on Ethereum and say we see a path here. We, right, but we, do you understand? I've heard this exact same narrative like fifty plus times from other blockchains. It's it's meaningless. It's just meaningless. Well, I don't know about that. You're I saying, mean, trust Coin, me, bro. Coinbase is and the this only is company forth, so. that has. I have a lot of other so points many users about. and so much TVL. Like I just opened L2 Beat. Another great yeah. site is Grow the Pie XYZ. Like Base Let's, has uh, today six billion in TVL, and their whole company is aligned. This is back and forth. You're, 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 you're yeah. dominating yeah. A, little, a little bit now. And, and, Let's, and, let me go back to my, so, my, my uh, points here. You know, I yeah. I think you're both making valid points because you know another name I could add to the mix on the Ethereum side is BlackRock uh, through Securitize. But let's move on from this. I think yeah. both sides have made their points, but I want to—I really want to talk more about the specific L2 structure. Let's, let's, let's get into it. And, and I appreciate you biting the bullet on the L2 centralization path, but that's really where I'll go back to. Um, and, and, and also this argument from authority for you, it extends to the Ethereum developers saying L1 scaling is not possible, right? So like, I, what will it take? Like, I actually think the technology is implemented today. Like we have multiple examples of far superior technologies deployed on blockchains today. We have sharding fully deployed. We have paralyzed systems fully deployed. Like 
isn't reality proving that position wrong? Aren't your experts, aren't the authorities that you trust wrong in this? And when they say we can't scale the L2 without sacrificing desensitization, I think that's a false dichotomy. This whole idea of saying, oh no, if you, if you scale the system, you sacrifice desensitization. I think that's not, that's not true at all. Actually, well, uh, Justin, I think I think it's that these that. gigabrains have looked at the uh, menu of research uh, options as they understand it. I'm a cryptocurrency researcher. I've been a crypto full time professional cryptocurrency researcher for ten years. I can make up my mind, and I'm here to debate you, not what. Like, if you keep making these arguments from authority, I'm not debating you. I'm debating well, if, if, Justin Drake If you don't Drake allow me something. to finish my sentence, then That's it sounds like an argument from authority. But I'm really trying to explain a structural point here, which is that. You know, you give an example of sharding. Uh, an example of a, an L1 in production with sharding for, for years is Nier. I'm not familiar enough with the Nier's architecture to get in the weeds, but I am familiar enough with Solana's. And I can say that that what Solana has done to achieve high TPS under global synchronous atomic composability is they have a, a, a single client chain that yeah, it's a, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a leader based it, it's design. It's not like, possible um, for them to pursue client look, diversity the way this, Ethereum does. This is does. a straw man argument. Uh, I'm, I'm not they, saying Ethereum needs to adopt Solana's design. How is it a straw man to say that Ethereum's high TPS competitor is is because is, if you don't like the trade offs, demonstrably of, more centralized. If you don't like the trade offs of parallelization, if you don't like the trade offs of Solana, don't adopt that technology. Adopt sharding instead. There's perfectly viable technologies. You know, if Ethereum just adopts parallelization right? And does not increase the gas limit, right? No requirements would go down, right? It makes the system more decentralized. Why would you not implement that? Why? Look, you're, you're exactly right from an absolutist standpoint that parallelization uh, may be a net win for the L1 uh, uh, in, in an abstract kind of alternate reality counterfactual sense, but they had to make a choice and they chose two things. They chose blobs, which are currently uh, uh, newly live and scaling up using uh, uh, the P2P uh, technology that's uh, currently scheduled to come in next year's hard fork, Pectra. And the, the P2P technology is key because it allows us to increase the number of blocks. Okay. And, and I also have to say here, but like you, you, you actually you, claimed- You, you asked me why they of... don't do parallelization, right? And the answer is because they did, I... they did P2P data sampling and ZK and the L1 of, instead I have a lot of, of notes here, and, and, and like if I'm letting you do a back and forth of my bit, just please keep it short. Um, look, and, okay, and wait, also, so Justin, yeah. before so, you... Before well, I'm not you... going to do a back and forth if you don't let me finish my sentences because then I don't get a chance to really <laughs> respond, right? So All I right, think what, let's, yeah, okay, why don't we do this? We're going to take a quick break to hear from the sponsors to make this show possible. But when we, when we return, we'll have Justin uh, finish out his, I guess, responses to Ryan, and then Ryan can respond to those responses. So... Mantel LSP is a permissionless and non-custodial Ether liquid staking protocol deployed on Ethereum and governed by Mantle. Emeth serves as the value accumulating receipt token of Mantle LSP and is now the fourth largest ETH LST with $1.3 billion in TVL. In addition to native ETH POS staking yields, Emeth holders can access various yield opportunities across dApps on Mantle Network L2 integrations and more. Emeth holders have previously received over 1 million in ICON token airdrops. With the upcoming October 2024 launch of Cook, the new governance token of Mantle LSP, Emeth holders can start accruing powder rewards under Season 1, Meth Amorphosis, which will be convertible to Cook. Visit emeth.mantle.xyz slash campaigns to learn more. Polkadot is the original and largest Layer 0 blockchain with over 2,000 plus developers. And the anticipated Polkadot 2.0 upgrade will be a massive accelerator for the ecosystem, upgrading the infrastructure with eight times higher transaction throughput and twice as fast block times, perfectly tailored core time for the needs of every protocol, trustless bridges internally and into Ethereum, Cosmos, Near, Binance Smart Chain, and revised tokenomics and the implementation of a token burn to reduce inflation. Perfect for GameFi and DeFi to build, grow, and scale with one of the most active crypto communities in this space. Polkadot recently announced a partnership with Mythical Games, bringing top games like NFT Rivals with over 650,000 players and 43 million transactions to pave the way for GameFi and the Polkadot ecosystem. Get your Web3 ideas to market fast with economics that work for you. Think big, build bigger with Polkadot. Join the community at polkadot.network slash ecosystem slash community. Coinbase One is the ultimate crypto membership, now with a community of 400,000 worldwide. 
With Coinbase One, you enjoy zero trading fees, up to 5.6% APY on USDC, 24-7 priority support, and exclusive partner deals. Coinbase One members also get higher reward rates on Solana, Cardano, Cosmos, and Tezos, earning even more while putting their crypto to work. Experience it free for 30 days with promo code UNCHAINED at coinbase.com slash one. Stellar invites you to join the discourse at the sixth edition of Meridian, a Web3 conference hosted by the Stellar Development Foundation in London, England, from October 15th through 17th, 2024. Meridian is where developers, builders, policymakers, and business leaders convene to discuss the present and future of everything from tokenization to DeFi. Get $50 off your ticket now at meridian.stellar.org by using the code UNCHAINEDPOD. Back to my conversation, or shall I say debate, with Justin and Ryan. So as we were saying, Justin, you want to complete your yeah. Responses. Yes, I've, I've quite a few. And and you mentioned like multiple times that uh, the L1, Ethereum's L1 is scaling, and that's simply just not true. Like, you know, I've studied the roadmap pretty extensively, and at least for five plus years, there's no, I mean, I mean, like, like they literally took increased gas limits off the roadmap, right? That's the only thing they need to do. And obviously, some proper scaling technologies would be great, but that's just, it's not being pursued. So I just, I reject this notion like, I'm not going to let you get away with saying Ethereum is scaling the L1. It's just not true. There's no plans. There's no commitment. Nothing. Okay. So, um, you know, and you also make this argument of maximum decentralization. I say, like, I don't think that's true. If you look at the current technologies, right, in, in order to create the most decentralized blockchain, you don't do single core processing. Just for the audience at home to understand this as well, because Ethereum lacks parallelization it, it it needs to process things in sequence certain things in sequence with a single process with a single core that's extremely inefficient like all of our modern devices have multi-core functionality so i mean that's just an example of how archaic the technology is and that layer two is just this band-aid that's being slapped on that 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 cannot replace the functionality of the layer one. I mean, when, when it really comes down to it, I mean, the layer one gives you maximum decentralization. The layer one gives you those, 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 those guarantees of financial sovereignty. And if you, if, 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 if you're telling the majority of users to go use layer twos that, that don't give you anywhere near the same guarantees, that's a downgrade. Like that's a major betrayal of the cypherpunk principles. You went from everyone's decentralized, everyone has the same power as central banks, to, oh, no, 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 you're a second-class citizen and you can be censored, you can have your funds frozen, stolen, um, you know, th censored the works. I mean, basically crushing the cypherpunk dream under the weight of KYC and AML and, and institutional censorship. Like, that is not the vision of blockchain for me at all. And this is what I feel like, what that is what you're defending right now. And, and a lot of this rhetoric, I think, strikes me as being circular. You know, we say, if is the next generation economy, quote unquote, or, um, you know, if is money. These are the type of circular arguments that I see from Bitcoiners all the time. There's no substance to it. Anyone can say these words. They don't actually mean anything if you don't actually dig down and, and, and actually have actual utility. You know, and this whole idea as well, you defended this idea of high fees, yeah, I think this idea of high fees is utterly ridiculous. It, it really is. It's a really ridiculous idea to think that people, even L2s over the longer run, would be willingly play, pay for, for, for high fees. Because I think ultimately, in order to achieve maximum decentralization, you need to achieve the right balance between node requirements and scalability. Because if you put the node requirements at the absolute minimum, and you have a chain that no one can use, it will just slide into irrelevancy. Like 10 guys running nodes out of their basements like is not very decentralized, even if they can do it on their Raspberry Pis. Okay? Wait, and so but, Justin, just yeah. to make clear, so you think the L1 should scale by parallelizing or using sharding, and then what role would the L2s have? Or do you feel like Ethereum went to L2s too early? Or do you think L2s shouldn't exist? Like, what do you think would be optimal setup, even in terms of kind of like minimum requirements for nodes? Right. And, and well, I think the minimum requirement, I think most of us can agree. If, if you can run it off just a, a normal gaming computer, for instance, like I'm fine with that. If you make that the kind of minimum spec, that's personally, or like a, you know, recent laptop or something. And how like, does that like, compare okay to, that. to the current uh, minimum requirement? 
Oh, it's lower. The minimum requirement's lower right now, so you could run it off a Raspberry Pi, I believe, today. Um, but but the thing is, like, I'm not even against scaling Ethereum. Like with sharding, you could achieve 100,000 TPS and still run it off a Raspberry Pi, right? Because that's a form of horizontal scaling. So, like, I I think uh, Ethereum is kind of like um, trapped in in its past. It's trapped in the past. It still thinks the classical blockchain dilemma is a thing. It's not. There is no sacrifice between security and decentralization anymore. The in, within the trade-off space, if you compare a purely paralyzed system with a sharded system, there is a compromise between uh, speed and capacity. That, that's, that's a legitimate trade-off. Ethereum is not even in that tra trade-off space anymore. They've given up. Like okay. 100 TPS, 13-second block times. It's, it's, it's pathetic. It can't compete over the long run. And, and just saying, oh, no, all going into L2s. No, these L2s are just taking all the users. They're parasites. They're taking the fees. Eventually, you know what? They're probably going to be an L2 on a blockchain with better security because it's scalable. And if you ask, if Ethereum were to scale today, which it absolutely could, and if it did, what would happen to all these layer twos? I'll tell you what happens. All these, all, these, all these layer two tokens, all this equity, literally billions of billions of dollars are just going to go bankrupt. Because there's no point to them if the layer one scales. I mean, I do think there is a place for layer twos, but it's a small niche compared to what like a fully scalable layer one is capable of. So, so that to me is just the travesty. That's the betrayal. That's why it's, it's tantamount to treason. You're, you're basically selling, selling out Ethereum to these VCs who can now rent seek over former Ethereum users. And eventually the network effects move somewhere else. I mean, that's why Solana to today often has more TPS than Ethereum and all layer twos combined. I mean, read the writing on the wall. Okay. This is what's happening. And it before before um, Ryan gives his full rejoinder, I just have to ask you, Ryan, you made quite a face when Justin said that the blockchain trilemma doesn't exist, that there's no trade-off anymore between security and decentralization. You definitely um, made a very notable, uh, you had a notable reaction to that. So why was that? Well, Laura, following the Ethereum core dev activity and speaking regularly with DeFi founders and L2 founders, uh, and you know, prospective customers, and you know, reading reading like vision manifestos written by very serious L1 customers again, like Base, but not just Base companies like like Arbitrum or zk Sync, they don't see security as this kind of flattened triangle point. They you know they they, they don't see it as 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 this as this. They believe the trilemma is alive and well. Is is uh, it's not a widely shared view that the scaling trilemma doesn't exist anymore. Okay. And one question before you give your um, response to Justin that I did want to ask was, you know, when you were making your points, it almost felt to me like you were saying that Ethereum at this point in time has built and scaled for a future that is going to come, but hasn't yet arrived. Is that kind of what your, if we were going to like summarize what your stance is, is that fair to say? That's certainly Ryan. my point. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. I thought yeah, you were asking Justin I... that as one last. Yeah. Oh, did I say uh, Justin? I meant Ryan. Yeah, pardon me. Uh, totally agree. Uh, uh, Ethereum is, you know, uh, uh, we all saw Dune 2, hopefully. Fantastic movie. Uh, you know, our plans are measured in centuries or at least decades. Uh, we're, we're ready for the whole world to come on chain. We're ready to see a, a Cambrian explosion of uh, 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 highly diverse L2s in the coming years. It's not just about what tech stack they're using. It's not even just about uh, you know which industry they're in. It's it's going to be everything. You know, for for example, uh, recently we we have a founder uh, working on a uh, halal finance L two, which is uh, an L two specifically geared towards Islamic finance. I think that's a beautiful thing. You know, it, it's like Reddit. You know, you see a subreddit, make a subreddit for anything: your sports team, your pet fish, your town, your your occupation, your hobby. L twos are the same way. Uh, it's not just going to be uh, uh, L two specialization in a small number of dimensions like tech or geographic region. It's going to be this beautiful, multifaceted uh, kind of Hayekian marketplace of choose your own adventure on Ethereum. I think that's what people don't get about L2s. You know, They just think it's only supposed to be an extension of the L1, but it, it's really about providing an economic system, an economic toolkit of Legos for the world. And you said earlier that you think L1 fees will definitely increase again. How do you see that happening? Well, uh, L1 block space, to Justin's point, is going to remain uh, with a relatively inelastic supply. Uh, while, while uh, as I'll get into in my kind of main main uh, segment next, 
L1 scaling is on the roadmap and we will see uh, L1 execution block space increases in the coming years. It's always going to be relatively small as an overall of the uh, eco, uh, uh, total block space in industry. Uh, and it's always going to be relatively inelastic. So as adoption grows, uh, an important thing to understand about L2s is that L2 activity causes L1 activity. L2 is like, you know, call it United States of America on Ethereum. And L1 is like New York. Um, the, the two economies complement each other. And so when you see an increase in L2 activity, on average, you're going to see an increase in L1 activity from, you know, the key customer segments of whales, corporations, governments, and roll-ups. It's because it's a great example would be the recent BlackRock win. Like, why did they launch that on Ethereum? Because it's dirt cheap for them and it's extremely reliable and proven. And their instrument can then be distributed to this full on-chain economy of L2s through the, the, you know, the system of, of trustless L2 bridging, modulo the training wheels, which are obviously a very serious deal, things like L2 security councils uh, and, and the like. And so uh, like if, if Ethereum is, is scaling the way the world scales. Fragmentation is natural to, to humanity. A t- globally synchronous atomic composability of having the, the whole global economy in a single state machine where any piece of state can, uh, in the same transaction, interact with any other as they can on the Ethereum L1, on the Solana L1, this is not actually that valuable. Uh, uh, and that's something Vitalik's written about recently. And so uh, I'll, I'll sort of pause there, and then uh, I'd be happy to respond to Justin's points uh, he made earlier. Well, okay, go ahead and do that, because we're we only have like roughly 20 minutes left. And I really want to ask some other questions about Ethereum itself. So go ahead. What was your response to his comments? Beautiful. So in in short, compute uh, how fast the validator computer is and whether it's parallelized or anything going on inside that computer is no longer the bottleneck to Ethereum's decentralization. The bottleneck now is bandwidth. It's connecting that computer to the rest of the global network. And so uh, that's what people who are trying to scale the L1, and they, they do exist, uh, are, are really focused on. It's, it's We currently cannot increase the number of blobs, which is three blobs per block every 12 seconds. We can't increase this number currently because already Den Kuhn has resulted in stress on home staker bandwidth. And so we're going to need to ship the new P2P blob system in order to uh, unlock the ability to dramatically increase the blob count in the coming years. So it's really bandwidth that's the problem now. And parallelization... Uh, uh, really can solve the problem inside the computer of being able to up that TPS on that machine, but it's not gonna it's not gonna help you with your bandwidth problem because all those parallelized threads are sh- uh, still have to uh, you know communicate with the broader network. And so uh, L1 scaling is being pursued. The P2P blobs is a, is a key part of that unlock. Uh, Z- ZKing the L1 is something that a lot of researchers, especially Justin Drake, has talked about for for a long time now. Uh, statelessness. Uh, which is which is a, a new system to try to limit the data growth in the L1, and then there's a, a massive internal change called uh, Verkle tries, which is just sort of this nerdy under the hood change, which prepares us for further L1 scaling. That's been been in the oven for some years now, Laura. And so this idea that L1 scaling is not being pursued is is it you know pardon me, Justin, literally incorrect. It's just that the L1 did not scale in the way that Justin would prefer, which is via parallelization. And so uh, a couple other points here, like uh, there will be L2s as decentralized as the L1. Arbitrum is three years old. It's the oldest uh, generalized full rolled up, uh, full roll up. Uh, the L2 roadmap is four years old. Ethereum is like uh, nine years old. We need to give it time, you know, time, time for growth, time uh, to evolve the L1 slowly to maintain maximum credible neutrality. And uh, on this idea that Solana has more TPS than full L2s, in a recent week, uh, uh, about two weeks ago, uh, I pulled some data and Solana did 380 user transactions per second by, 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 by users, either, either humans or bots. And during that same period, full rollups did 100 TPS. And uh, the total L2 ecosystem, uh, including those with off, one L, uh, off L1 data, which is uh, the, the key validium category, such as Immutable X, which is uh, a titan in emerging gaming on Ethereum. These chains are already doing like significant fractions of Solana's TPS. Like I have rollup.wtf, rollup.wtf uh, open now. This exact moment, we're doing 250 TPS, including off L1 DA, which is a, which is a big caveat. And if I switch over to blobs, we're doing 120 
you know, which is almost a third of the Solana data point that I measured two weeks ago. And, you know, I don't think Solana's done like above 700 user TPS on a sustained basis in years. So th- this idea that like Solana scales harder than the L2 ecosystem, it doesn't. It just has an advantage in global synchronous atomic composability. But even modern L2 stacks like Mega ETH, which is the, uh, the L2 that is unashamedly pursuing high TPS by relying on the L1 for settlement and relying on highly specialized like giant sequencer boxes that, you know, are kind of similar to Solana full nodes. And then a, a, a prover, like Mega Ether is going to be an L2 that's a Validium that is, you know, gunning for Solana's title of the most TPS in global synchronous atomic composability. So uh, I just I just don't see these ideas that the L1 isn't scaling. It's just scaling in a particular way that not everybody uh, agrees with. Uh, and so I would sort of challenge Justin, like, like you're you're never going to be happy with our L1 scaling like in the next decade is is my sense and you know I just want to I just want to set that to the side my my question Justin is what do you need to see from the L2 model to believe that L2s are not parasitic is it high L1 fees is it is it a lack of L2s on other chains like how can we convince you L2s aren't parasitic because from where I'm sitting there's a hell of a lot of ether liquidity on base and and ether is used as money on base and I just don't see this case for long-term par- parasitic L2s yeah but I do want to throw something in there which is I don't know if you guys saw this but four days ago when um, the ethereum Foundation did their AMA on reddit somebody asked about whether there were plans to scale ethereum layer one and Justin Drake responded the long-term sustainable and elegant plan is to use the magic of snarks to scale L1 EVM execution. So snarks, can somebody somebody define that? Yeah, um, and that's that's the possibility of creating a ZK EVM, which I agree is very, very exciting. But the state of timelines are five plus years out, and I just do not consider that at all competitive. And honestly, as a cryptocurrency investor or any investor, if a software engineer tells you five plus years, I think they don't have a clue, honestly. That's well, I okay. Think. But I think yeah. some people I don't take had thought that ZK rollups would be further out than they ended up being. So, you know, timelines are wonky ZK a little bit. ZK rollups is not quite the same challenge, though. It's, it's, it's a different beast. Okay. Yeah. I'm just going to read a little bit more of what he wrote here just to throw this into the mix. Um, he said, with real-time layer one EVM snarking, attesters can verify cheap snarks instead of naively re-executing EVM transactions. This would allow us to increase the gas limit by orders of magnitude without burdening validators. So I think this goes to the decentralization point. All the heavy EVM execution would happen outside of consensus by specialized nodes operated by entities like searchers, builders, explorers, users, and consensus participants would have it easy, for example, running their nodes on phones or watches. So um, it's, it's kind of a fantasy to me, though, because, again, five plus years, that's not a realistic timeline at all. Like, I mean, people, you can talk and you can talk, but like. You know, I mean, Ryan keeps saying, oh, they're going to increase uh, gas limit. They removed it from the roadmap, right? It's not on the roadmap. And and to answer, if I can answer uh, Ryan's question, if now's a good time, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Um, you know, to answer your question, what would it take for me to not support layer two scaling and, and uh, sorry, to come to support layer two scaling as opposed to layer one scaling? I think I would have to be proven wrong when it comes to layer one scaling. I think that's... That's the key attribute, because I think even according to your own acknowledgements, there's a bunch of compromises that are being made. Like you're saying, you expect a lot of it to be centralized, you know, um, et cetera. Like, so, and, and I, think, I think there's a big mismatch. So that's why I want to bring it back to the blockchain dilemma. So when Vitalik, I think it was in 2015, 14, I don't remember, but when Vitalik first wrote that paper about the blockchain dilemma, he said, uh, the blockchain dilemma is something that applies to traditional blockchain designs because, you know, at that time they were still looking at sharding as a form of horizontal scaling. And 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 I'm just going to call it out. I think, Ryan, that you're out of date on, on some of the latest developments because it's fine if you don't accept the, the trade-offs of, of something like what Solana is doing, but sharding is a different beast, right? We can keep node requirements low and do 100,000 plus TPS. Right. Like rendering and and this goes to why I don't think this will happen, and especially not in five plus years, rendering all of these L2s, you know, unnecessary. Right. If we were to implement a technology like that. So, you know, I, I would really challenge you on that because right now, let me just repeat. Right now, we can do over 100,000 TPS while keeping node requirements low. There's two blockchains arguably more, but let's say two blockchains that have fully implemented sharding, which in my view, 
proves that we can do L1 scaling. And if we can do L1 scaling, why, why, for God's sakes, why would we accept all this centralization? For God's sakes, why would we accept all this fragmentation? Why would we accept all of those fees? Because the bottom line is still, the bottom line is still, if the L1 can scale, all of the fees that the layer twos are capturing actually should have gone to that layer one. Like that is the real tragedy. That's the real disempowerment that's happening here. So, like, I actually think that is a really important point to acknowledge Brian, when we literally have shadow systems that. deployed today. I feel like you're sticking your head in the sand, yeah. Brian, yeah, you just, look no, I just, I just think there's a certain amount of hubris on your side that you're saying we have this 100,000 TPS capability today. Okay, Solana does less than 1,000 user TPS, and they're, they're, Can you they're, stop you know, straw manning uh, Solana here? Because I'm not making that argument. Okay, but Solana is up like 7x in Ether terms from its recent low before, you know, they started... So this is not a counter climb. argument to near an EGLD having fully implemented sharding, right? That's that's okay, the argument I'm presenting to you. Growing? Maybe maybe there are maybe blockchain growth is a holistic concept that is more than just about TPS. The L1 has chosen to specialize in credible neutrality. They were looking at execution sharding for no, years. Hold on, no, no, hold on, hold on. You can't say credible neutrality no, while pushing here. users you onto that sensor we're accepting platforms. Centralization and fragmentation, but we're not accepting centralization because the, the marketplace of L2s is literally decentralized. It's literally lots of different entities choosing to create L2s. We're not accepting fragmentation because fragmentation is inherent to the human economic condition. Look at Solana now. They're adopting L2 specifically because people want to control their own block space. They want to have customized uh, implementation, customized chains to target their own use cases. It's not a question of whether there's going to be lots of chains. It's a question of whether there's going to be lots okay, of alt okay, L1s I'm gonna, I'm gonna and keep, L2s. Yeah. I'm going to keep saying this. You keep using Solana as an example. You're kind of yeah. associating yeah, all the other Solana. Are, are, it's not fair. They, they no, have no, no so, users, no, no growth. They've I'm, had years to make it happen. I'm showing you the technology is here and that Ethereum could adopt that technology. Solana has nothing to do with that argument okay. if I'm talking I, I about do, Shari. I, I, but, I do have a question. I do have a question, though, because... So, um, you know, I think what Ryan is referencing is Solana's quote unquote network extensions, which um, is their phrase for layer twos. Apparently, they don't want to call them layer twos after having criticized Ethereum for having layer twos. Um, but anyway, uh, one question that I had, um, this came up on one of the recent podcasts that discussed this, but um, I think it was the one with Kyle Samani on Bankless. And, you know, he made the point, which is a good point, that there was this notion that there was this kind of like app chain thesis and people could deploy their own layer two and have a B for like gaming or for this or that. And it would be customized. But instead now we have all of these layer twos where, you know, Aave exists on all of them and, you know, uh, makers on all of them or, you know, whatever. It's just like all of these different apps now have to deploy on every new layer two. And so you can't prevent people from, deploying on your chain, which makes it hard to kind of, you know, quote unquote, customize it. So, uh, you know, is that, is that kind of future that people described actually playing out? Absolutely. If you, if you look at, you know, I think, I think, you know, I followed Kyle's work for years and I think Kyle, who is somebody who has had a lot of great app layer ideas uh, over the years in, in, in my view, and that's sort of his, his strength of imagining what apps could be. But then when it comes to infrastructure, he has these, what, what I've called strong views, strongly held where like, okay, so today generalized L2s are bigger than app chains. Does that mean app chains are dead forever? You know, maybe there are certain kinds of apps that make sense to deploy everywhere, like your Aves, like your infrastructure type foundational Legos. And then maybe there are other kinds of apps where it does make sense to have your own chain, like a, like a, like a friend tech or a poly market or many kinds of potential uh, business models in the future. So I just think we need we need to have a, a level of curiosity and humility about what we've seen so far versus what could emerge in the that? future. Aave and Uniswap for that matter, and a lot of these L1 applications would have been far better off if the L1 just scaled, right? That's why a lot of the DEX volume is moving to Solana because it, it, it's, it's all fragmented and it's all like, you, ha you have to like, it's all centralized on Ethereum now if you actually want to use those things. Like, are you kidding? Like, come on, let's have a bit of a reality check here. We're talking about an ecosystem where the top 15 L2s can all steal user funds. That's what we're talking about here. So, I mean, just a bit of yeah. a reality check, right? Okay, one other thing that I wanted to bring up, because I did see that this kind of like underlying assumption was in a lot of the arguments of people who were talking about how L2s are not parasitic, 
And Zach Rines, aka Chainlink God, uh, expressed it very well in a tweet. He said, what I see is the weakest argument here, though, is the value of ETH being a gas token. This value prop will, uh, will be abstracted to being worth almost zero. This is his opinion. L2 rollups will increasingly start to natively accept tokens other than ETH as gas tokens. It's inevitable. And then he went on to give an example. He said, so for instance, base, quote, it would be in Coinbase's best interest to support USDC as a gas token, given number one, the user experience of supporting USDC as a gas token is strictly superior to that of just supporting ETH, like only ETH. Um, so meaning he was saying that they could add it as an option. And then he said, quote, we have been absolutely gaslit into thinking the awful user experience of managing L1 gas tokens for all these chains, in addition to the actual tokens you want to hold or use is somehow okay, but it's not. And then he went on to add that, you know, for instance, like uh, Coinbase generates yield off of its USDC reserves. And because it, you know, Coinbase itself is the one collecting the fees off base and, you know, it's a, it's a US company accounting in US dollars, which you know, could happen um, if if they were doing this in USDC would be a lot easier. And he noted that Base is only paying 1% of its fee revenue to Ethereum. So they don't need to hold the other 99% in Ether. And obviously, if Ether is fluctuating in value, it's, it's not even good for them to do that. So, um, you know, what do you think of this notion that I keep hearing from L2s that, oh, but, you know, the value is going to accrue to ETH when nothing is preventing these L2s from adopting other gas tokens? I think I think it's all just very wishful thinking. And I think eventually Ethereum won't, will no longer be the most secure L1. And at that point, it makes sense for these L2s just to move or even just become L1s on their own right because now they have a user base that they got from ETH, right? Uh, well, Justin, how is Ethereum going to no longer be the most secure L1 when we've pursued security, in your view, against scaling? Like because, security because, is our product. No, no, because it, again, our... you're, you're again bringing up this blockchain dilemma that I'm saying has been solved, especially if, if I were to bring a concrete example through sharding, right? That's a that's a best way to solve the blockchain dilemma. Now, I think before, I, I, I think, you know, according to your own acknowledgement, you're not actually familiar with these technologies that are being developed. That's ridiculous. But, I've been full-time oh, in this okay. space for six okay. years. Okay. I have a computer so, so, science so you degree. you are familiar with, because Nier only implemented this like a, a month ago, right? And, I don't study uh, Nier in detail, but I'm familiar okay. with the trilemma right. and I'm right. familiar with extensive so, efforts so, to pursue so, execution So you know we can achieve 100,000 TPS with a Raspberry Pi. You know that, Look, right? You you disagree with our can, choice can to you scale agree with through... That? No, no, hold on. Can you agree with that? No, I'm not going to agree with that. You can find... Show me somebody who does that in production today. Yeah, okay. By the right? time it's done in production, it's way too late for Ethereum. You realize that, right? This is the classic argument. You know, I, I remember talking to Justin, Bitcoiners Justin, in, in you know, 2015. The, the funny thing is that and they you were like, I can't take this. Like, you're, you're, you're talking over me. You're talking over me. Excuse me. But Sorry. you didn't let me finish. I remember you in, 2015, me in 2015. Uh, I remember Bitcoin is telling me, oh, well, I'll believe it when Ethereum has more usage than Bitcoin, right? I remember those arguments. And you're giving me the same argument. And once it no, does, the whole post just on move again. Beat and Dune and Grow the Pie that shows the massive real world impact of the L2 ecosystem. I have BlackRock and Sony and you know a, a growing a growing list of organizations that are seeing that L2s More are arguments from authority people. when the bottom line is they're it's all not centralized an authority when there's and, data justin and you're the authority the, you're trying to say that just because we didn't pursue yeah, your because i can think for myself you, know, you because, because i don't blindly follow what what your leaders tell you so, I'm right? sorry, you, you think that hundreds of researchers who worked for Again, years to determine argument that- argument from authority. The fact is we have shot Not everything you disagree today. with is an argument from authority. You are the authority that is claiming that because Ethereum did not pursue your chosen strategy of parallelization, okay, guys, that we're, our, scaling, we're, our scaling system is we're rehashing. We're rehashing arguments from that earlier. So we're, why don't we move on? But I did you know, uh, just want to ask, so when it comes to these- um, to these arguments about right, all the activity on Ethereum accruing to ETH, do you think that that will happen, Ryan? Or do you see that there could be a danger with L2s, you know, using other tokens for gas? I'm not worried about gas tokens, Laura, because uh, ultimately, you know, folks are going to use whatever gas token is right for their particular customer segment, depending on the business model of their L2. And for many L2s, that'll be either. And for, for many, it won't. And for many, they're just going to totally sponsor gas on behalf of their users as a sort of loss leader, the same way that you don't pay to use Facebook or, or, or many, you know, Apple services. Well, Apple, bad example, because you buy the phone. 
And so but, uh, like, Apple's actually then, a great example because you may, you may have Apple sponsoring user gas transactions through a blockchain that's vertically integrated into the phone. So I, I don't worry about the gas. Sounds token, super decentralized. I, I'm speaking, Justin. So what one I do worry about so is the Ryan, use of Ether as money. I, I, it is very important for Ether to continue to be used in as many places as possible, in as many ways as possible, and with, with as much size as possible. Okay, and, but I feel like in the back and forth with Ryan, at some point you said something about how the price of Ether didn't matter for security, but because it is a proof of stake system, I think it does, right? It does matter. Yeah, the price the price does matter because it determines the level of economic security, which determines how much it costs to extract uh, like horrifyingly toxic levels of MEV from the chain through various attack vectors. If you want to learn much more about that, you can see the Justin Anatoly debate uh, uh, recently. Yeah, I don't remember what was happening in the back and forth there, but you suddenly did say that at one point, and I was like, "Wait, that, that's I don't think that's true." Um, but so at this point in time, like you know, we're in this situation where for this year, ETH as a layer one asset has not been able to retain value. At the same time that we are seeing these layer twos are collecting all these fees, they're paying almost nothing to Ethereum. And earlier you said like you felt like we're in this kind of period where Ethereum has been built for a future that you think is going to come, but it hasn't come yet. So do you just view this as kind of like temporary growing pains or, okay, so what this do you- This is Ethereum's puberty, Laura. Okay. So then just describe how it is that if we're, if we're going to see that layer twos are taking other tokens besides ETH and that um, we're going to have, you know, all these different layer twos, especially if um, many of, of them are centralized, then how is it that the, the value of ETH is going to go up again? You know, um, we haven't ever since the Denkun upgrade, we have not seen ETH be in that deflationary state that we saw before. And just to make clear to people, because I don't think we got to this earlier in the episode, but the Denkun upgrade is what made it so cheap for these rollups to have all these transactions. Because before then, we had been seeing that there was a certain amount of activity on the layer one that was allowing much more ETH to be burned, which allowed uh, the asset to be deflationary for actually a, a pretty good stretch in there. So, you know, Ryan, what do you think turns this around? Laura, I'll tell you my prediction here. I predict that in the coming years, not not 10 years, like like one one to three years, the level of L2 adoption in, in all key metrics, end users, new chains, corporate and government adoption, capital flows, trading activity, I predict that the level of Ethereum L2 adoption greatly eclipses that of alt L1s as well as on other chains. That would be my first prediction. My second prediction is that Ether remains the number one trustless collateral and uh, you know digitally native money on this new you know hyper-growing on-chain economy. And my third prediction is that L1 fees will again become extremely high, although uh, I think especially for L1 execution, that's going to take quite a bit longer. I think blob fees will be non-trivial even like a year from now. And so uh, I really see the L2 model working out. And, and that's my prediction is that the whole world comes on Ethereum and Ether plays a major role in that as a digitally native programmable money. And, uh, you know, the L1 fees uh, uh, tick up, which, you know, as someone who studied fees for the last five years and, you know, wrote some pretty early viral material on it, Ethereum is not a business. We don't get the value of Ether from fees, but it sure is nice to see those high fees. And I believe we will, Laura. Okay. Um, I did want to ask you both about another solution that Adam Cochran tweeted about. He said, based rollups are what will solve the ETH L2 economic debate. And he said, um, first of all, they're two times orders of magnitude cheaper to run. They require being an ETH validator to participate. They require ETH staking as pre-confirmation commitment. They create competitive auctions for MEV, um, which you know, requires paying for gas. Um, they can be interoperable without bridges, et cetera. What do you think of that notion? So um, actually, I, I was just writing that down. I wanted to touch on this before we ended this conversation. That's perfect. Um, I love, uh, if, if properly done, so properly done on like layer one kind of level, like uh, enshrined slash based uh, sequencing and sl enshrined slash based uh, rollups. In theory, I actually love the idea. I actually 
do not consider that even to be a form of layer two scaling. I know that's a bit confusing because it has roll up in the name, like based roll ups, right? But I actually think that's- I mean, it's literally of- another blockchain using Ethereum for its sequencing. So I think yeah, but- the key of the L2 scaling model is that there are other chains and not a single chain. So- wouldn't yeah, agree but with that. The, yeah, but the same is true for sharding, either. right? The same is true for sharding, and I and we would refer to that as a layer one. Um, for, like for me, I think if the whole thing acts as a coherent whole and there's shared pure like shared security, the for shards the are under the same thing, consensus. Uh, yes, the shards are under the same consensus. In the case of based uh, based rollup, they also be under the same consensus. At least my understanding, in terms of what I would see as a good type of uh, uh, design, at least. Pardon, I have seen other pardon chains. Pardon me, I meant that the, based, the, the, the shards have a uh, 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 synchronous settlement of all the shards in that each new L1 block in the parallelized system yeah. Yeah. updates the state of all the yeah. shards. It's not and, the case for rollups. You know, but, but I actually think if you had base rollups with base sequencing, it's basically equivalent to a sharded system. And I, I would This is why you've seen things like uh, certain right. folks, and this is definitely an argument from okay. authority, but you have guys like Vitalik saying, right. in a certain lens, rollups, okay. uh, uh, rollups are execution okay. sharding because so they put I, their data uh, I'm, on it. I think that's ridiculous, but I'm gonna I'm 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 gonna go back to the other it, argument. It has merit. Know. I don't I don't agree with it. I, 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 I agree with you on that point, but it has yeah, merit, yeah. right? You know, I mean, who, who's I, to I, say that I, rollups aren't on the charted. surface they look the same? But I think for me, the defining feature is does it all tie together as a single whole? Because then you get all the security guarantees, and then you get all of the uh, perfect UX, etc. So that's why Folks I like, like myself and Sri. Oh, pardon me. So, and this is why I like this idea of base uh, slash enshrined uh, sequencing and rollups. I think that's a great idea. However, let me explain why I think that will never happen. I actually think the Ethereum ecosystem is too far gone and, the, and it's facing massive perverse incentives now, right? Because in order for these layer twos to decentralize, right, pretty much for all of them, they need to surrender a massive amount of power and revenue. And this needs to happen at scale en masse for a lot of people. And I just don't think that that is realistic at all. I think that is actually a bit naive, even in the face of like all the experience we have with human history. You know, this idea that, oh, we're all just going to volunteer, like our optimism is opt- obsolete, arbitrum is opt- obsolete, and we're all just going to move to based uh, rollups, et cetera. Right. And so just, just to respond to your remark about, about you know, based, based rollups and decentralizing sequencers I, I wasn't and enshrinement. Finish. Maybe I could finish this point first. Um, sure. So, 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 so I would say like throughout human history, and, I, and this is my background as well, like throughout human history, we've seen that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And you've basically now set up a system we have private companies that are profiting of being centralized. And what you're saying is all of these layer twos, or at least a significant amount of them, will be either replaced by decentralized systems or will decentralize, thereby going against their incentives. I, I just don't understand. Why would a private company give up on that? Why? When, when, when the ecosystem has chosen base as the biggest blo- uh, L2, and that's like the most centralized thing that will never decentralize, right? Like... Like These are to, important questions. I totally agree. Yeah, uh, and, 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 and not and, with your and, point, but with the questions, the right. importance and, and of the questions. And now I want to contrast that. I, this is really important to me. But this can is really I the pause to respond? My, and, and, and then I'll let you respond. I, I'm sorry, I'm being a bit long-winded, but this is worth it. Okay, now I want to contrast that with the alternative, which is layer one scaling, which means you don't make the UX sacrifices. You don't make the sacrifices in centralization. You don't make the sacrifices in credible neutrality. You don't sacrifice your cypherpunk ideals. You don't sacrifice the UX. You don't sacrifice composability. You, you know, you don't put up with freaking admin keys, you know, that, that can steal user funds. None of those things. It just works like it was always intended to do with layer one scaling. If layer one scaling is viable, the entire layer two roadmap is effectively obsolete. And that's really my main message here. So, okay. And just to understand, so you feel like, um, and I know that was, so Ryan was bringing up Solana earlier and you kind of objected to that, but I was wondering, do you feel that Solana has a better roadmap than Ethereum or near or, okay. Yeah, I I would say Solana, just by virtue of it having like multiple orders of magnitude, more capacity. Yeah, it's better. Um, And also it's actually this pretty, very similar to Ethereum. I mean, it's, it has programmability. It has, it even has the same economic model. Actually, the only difference is one is, you know, high capacity, the other one is low capacity. And, And for years, even when it comes back to the Bitcoin debates, I've always argued the way layer one blockchain should be is a massive amount of transactions all paying a small fee that over the longer run, the blockchains that do this will be the most decentralized 
will be the most censorship resistant and will be the most credibly neutral. Unnecessarily bottlenecking Ethereum means it will never reach that top in the mountain. You're, you're handicapping it unnecessarily by not acknowledging the latest developments in technology. And, and that's, mm. again, a repeat of Bitcoin history. And it's beyond the scape of this discussion, but that comes down to governance. But I've t- Ryan, please respond. Okay. Sorry. Well, I, I mean, Justin, yeah. I'll give you points for being um, consistent over a very long time frame. Thank you. <laughs> Brian, Ryan, go ahead. I, Justin asked good questions here, and you know I was hung up there a moment because I mean that's the thing about consistency. I mean, Justin, you have been consistent, but I, I think you've been a little dogmatic. I mean, you, you've been repeating the same arguments for years now, even as the L2 model is is growing. And right now, the idea that you know folks used to say they're not even going to want L2s. Okay, well they want L2s, but now they're parasitic. Okay, well you know in the years to come, if that gets disproven, you know at what what point are you going to change your mind, right? And you know that's a rhetorical rhetorical question. So to, to jump into the meat of my response. Um, I'll start at the end, which is that the only difference between Solana and Ethereum is capacity. This is incorrect. I don't know. That, 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 that's, a, that's a gross oversimplification. I'm sorry. There yes, it is. So let me clarify on your behalf. Yeah, yeah. which is that uh, the biggest difference between Solana and Ethereum, and there are many differences, is that Solana has no formal protocol specification to be analyzed by an independent researcher community. And it has no real client okay, diversity. I'm just going to remind you here, arguing against Solana is not arguing against my arguments at all. Again, Justin, right? you just brought up Solana yourself. I'm responding to your direct point you brought up. I Lord learned from your feedback. Solana, in- if I'm not mistaken, I responded. So go ahead. Okay, you, you said the only difference between Solana and Ethereum is capacity, which you then called interrupting me a gross oversimplification. Within so the context me... of which is better, yes, sure. I mean, but again, this, the argument is moot because I'm not here. I'm, this is not an Ethereum versus Solana debate. Justin, I'm, I'm not buying it's not your turn. All right, go ahead. Solana has no real client diversity. That is the biggest difference. They have no protocol spec and they have no real client diversity. The problem with Fire Dancer is the difficulty of implementing a low-level hand-coded C module replica of the Solana protocol, which exists only embedded in the Solana Rust client and not in a standalone PDF spec that the Fire Dancer people can copy. This has caused delays and challenges in the Fire Dancer implementation. And this is not something that can be solved because by the time they produce a protocol spec, they need to then develop a research community uh, you know, I, I, I predict on a recent spaces that I said I would give Mert like a large sum of money if Fire Dancer had a fully independent code base and was in production by February, because it's just it's going to take so long because of this lack of diversity and lack of protocol spec. And so that that is Solana's biggest difference, but far from the only difference with Ethereum. It's and a so, man argument, just again. OK, well, we've invested in client diversity and it saved our bacon at least once. And, and a I lot of key stakeholders great. say it's important. So client diversity is very important. Opinion. And it's you know, great. You know, you're sort of saying, trust me, bro, client diversity is not important. So no, no, I'm not saying that. that. You're again making a straw man. Why are you jumping to all these incredibly weak why arguments sh- and straw man why, arguments? Why, why won't you okay. acknowledge that, that the technology that exists? Five different teams make implementing. Your next point. Go, yes. go, Ryan. You made your point about that. the clients. Go Thanks, ahead. Laurel. Next point. Uh, is this for me to you, make an? Oh, no, no, Ryan. Justin, Sorry, I'm still like on one of five. <laughs> and by the way, just so you know, we're, we're at an hour and 15 minutes. We're going to wrap this up shortly. So Ryan, go Beautiful. ahead and finish. <laughs> Ethereum didn't pick L1 scaling. And that's something Justin's gonna, Justin Bonds is going to have to live with because we chose the L2 model. And as Justin said, if L1 scaling is viable, then the entire L2 model is effectively obsolete. His quote. Justin's right. But I'm going to put a lot of heavy lifting on the word viable there. If an L1 replicates the level of trust in Ethereum and its concomitant and 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 its inseparable growth and network effects while having pure L1 scaling, like if they can do what we do with pure L1 scaling, then we have lost. We think they can't. And uh, to comment on base rollups, enshrinement, and decentralized sequencers, base rollups are totally cool. They're not uh, uh, like a like a like a silver bullet. They're just going to be one of the ways in which the L2 marketplace has high levels of diversity. On the topic of enshrinement, I do not believe we will see an enshrined rollup or L2 uh, for many years. And I think that's intentional to avoid a chilling effect in the marketplace. We want to, we want to, uh, uh, you know, fertilize and support this marketplace and, you know, prematurely enshrining something that we can't even say is like the right thing to enshrine would be a great way to, you know, harm what is currently one of our key advantages in that L2 marketplace. And on decentralized sequencers, 
look, there's going to be some L2s whose the business model makes sense to actually decentralize once the tech is there. And there's going to be some that, that don't in terms of sequencer decentralization as opposed to just theft of funds. Coinbase, I'll put a flag in the ground and say that Coinbase wants to decentralize their sequencer because control is liability and they intend to make their money by being the next generation bank and fintech, not from sequencer fees. They're going to make their money in application layer fees uh, and so I think that's something that Max Resnick gets wrong. He says, why would people give up the sequencer money? You know, like L1 sequencers or L2 sequencers made like 10% of L1 fees in a recent day. It's a lot of money. It's like half a million a day on some days, but it depends on the business model. There are some L2 customers, L2 operators for which sequencer fees are genuinely unimportant, even if they seem like lots of money, Coinbase included. Uh, uh, thanks, Laura. Okay. Yeah. And just for people, the Max Resnick conversation was a bankless interview where, yeah, he definitely took the view that L2s are parasitic. Okay. So I know, Justin, I know you have responses, but we we are at time. So you're going to have to, uh, I guess, write them up for Twitter when this episode comes out, which will be tomorrow. So, um, you know, you don't have to wait too long. But you guys, this uh, was a very wide ranging and interesting episode. And thank you for uh, making your points the way that you did. Um, where can people learn more about each of you and your work? Um, I'll start. Um, so you can you can find me on um, on Twitter under Justin Bonds, uh, Justin underscore Bonds, and uh, my company uh, where I uh, invest in cryptocurrency, according to some of the vision you heard here, is uh, Cyber Capital. So you can just look that up, and and, and that's where you can find me as well. So um, yeah, and I just want to uh, say thank you for Ryan. I, th I think you did a really good job with this debate, and I and I really appreciate. And I also thank you, uh, Laura, as well, for bringing this discussion and, and like bringing attention to it. I, I really appreciate that from the bottom of my heart because I think both me and Ryan do care about decentralization and, and really some of the cypherpunk underpinnings of this movement. And, and, and I do think our hearts are all in the right place here. So thank you. Laura, thanks for having me on the show. And, you know, uh, Justin, I think, I think you're, you're, you're somebody who has developed a thesis and invested against it. That's a beautiful thing. You know, I think your thesis is wrong and it's going to be very exciting as we get to see what happens in the years to come. And, you know, it is possible you end up being correct and that the L2 model was a mistake, but I certainly don't think so. And I don't think the latest data is showing that. And so uh, you can find me on Twitter at uh, Ryan Berkman's. Uh, I'm a payments builder and I'm co-founder of a soon to be announced institutional business development arm for Ethereum. All right. Well, thank you both so much for coming on Unchained. Thanks, Laura. Thank you. Thanks so much for joining us today. To learn more about Justin, Ryan, and Ethereum's roadmap, check out the show notes for this episode. Unchained is produced by me, Laura Shin, with help from Matt Pilchard, Juan Aranovich, Megan Gavis, Pam Jumdar, and Mark Akuria. Thanks for listening. Unchained is now a part of the Coindesk Podcast Network. For the latest in digital assets, check out Markets Daily, five days a week, with host Noel Atchison. Follow the Coindesk Podcast Network for some of the best shows in crypto.